Okay, let's get rolling. Um, our standard logistics opening. Um, that is, you should still be reading All the Devils Are Here, um, different pieces of it, for your sections. Um, by, for the sections starting on Thursday, I want you to have read the chapters on the bubble in subprime mortgages. That is how it was that mortgage companies, banks, and investors concluded that diversified investments in even risky mortgages, um, and even mortgages offered to people buying houses in the desert between Los Angeles and Albuquerque who could not document that they had stable employment or indeed any employment at all. Um, how people thought that through the magic of diversification and financial engineering, it was safe to invest in such things once they had been properly processed by the investment banks of America. And hence why investors all over the world who wanted to earn some interest on their money over and above what they could earn by investing in government bonds, but who didn't want to run much risks how it was that they decided they could invest in the American mortgage market. Um, problem set five. Um, problem set five will be due on Thursday. Um, and they're still uncertain whether to have um, what form problem set six should take. Um, I think problem set six will be largely a, um, say, a practice midterm exam. Uh, and will be due on March 3rd or so. So you can then take a look at the answers to it between March 3rd and March 10th, which is when the midterm exam will be. Um, and our first Berkeley Friday political economy colloquium struck me as a great success. Although we didn't see much, many of you there, we saw a whole bunch of people from Joseph Lau's um, upper level course. Um, and a splendid time was had by all arguing over austerity in the context of glo the global economic downturn. Um, so we are going to be doing another one on, I believe, say, not this Friday, um, not February 25th, but the following Friday, March 4th. Um, and once again, who would you most like to see? of the people who have been hanging around the political economy major in international and area studies more greatly. Um, because after this course, um, after teaching this course, I then have to get on the horn and see if I can line up three speakers for the panel for the Friday, March 4th political economy um, colloquium. All right, you seem to have reached an edge. Um, and Darius, yes, um, we'll put Darius on one one of these days. And Alan and Ananya, okay. I hear and obey, um, that's the word. Recapitulations. Um, I want you all to know how to use the magic equation for the income expenditure model. Um, given the four flows of autonomous demand. Right? Baseline confidence dependent consumption spending, investment spending by businesses, government purchases and gross exports, given the values of the tax rate, the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to import, um, what is going to be the level of real GDP um, in an economy once it reaches its balance and you no longer have unexpected inventory? Um, accumulation or decumulation. And yes, we're up to, well, 52% um, of those responding correct. Yes, if we have 3 trillion for C0 and then 2 trillion for each of the other components of autonomous spending, we have 9 trillion in the numerator. Um, and the denominator is um, going to be 0.5, so our multiplier is 2. Um, so we're going to have a real GDP level of 18 trillion. Um, that's something I want you to be able to do, um, if only because it was something Christina Romer had to do while working in the transition office in December 2008. Um, the other question I want you to remember is, or the other thing I want you to nail, is the seasonal adjustment factor in the unemployment rate. Um, 
we just saw seasonally adjusted unemployment decline from 9.4% in December to 9.0% in January, even though the seasonally unadjusted unemployment rate, the raw fraction of people answering the survey who said they had no job even though they were looking for them, jumped from 9.1% to 9.8% between the second week of December and the second week of January. Um, and yes, the seasonal adjustment factor assumes roughly that seasonal unemployment movements are proportional to the level of unemployment. Um, and I don't think that's the right thing for the Bureau of Labor Statistics to do, although they clearly do think it's the right thing for them to do, or they would not do it. <coughs> and then the last thing that I'm going to want you to absolutely nail for the midterm and thereafter um, is this complication from the, invest, from the income expenditure model, which we're calling the investment savings equation. Um, you know, that at least in changes or differences or deviations from baseline or trend form, um, what we want to say is what's happening to real GDP in the economy um, will be equal to the change in baseline autonomous spending divided by these multiplier terms that by now should be very familiar. Um, this thing that amplifies a change in autonomous spending into a larger change in real GDP. Um, and that amplifies it because when incomes go, when real GDP goes up, incomes go up. When incomes go up, people spend a greater proportion, a greater more money on their consumption spending. That's what the one minus TCY is doing in here. Uh, but offsetting that to some degree, um, when people spend more, they spend more on imports as well as domestically produced goods, and that spending doesn't increase production and incomes inside the United States. Um, then you take the change in baseline autonomous spending and divide it by the multiplier terms, where baseline autonomous spending, you remember, has a part that depends on consumer confidence. Um, how much of consumption spending is because consumers are feeling optimistic or pessimistic about the future rather than depending on their incomes. Um, the change in um, business um, baseline investment spending, that proportion of investment spending by businesses which comes out of the fact that they're either optimistic or pessimistic about the future and future profits and not out of the fact that when interest rates are higher, businesses tend to want to spend less on investment because borrowing to build new factories is expensive. Um, and then this part that's those exports that are produced by changes in exchange rate speculator views of the long-term likely value of the exchange rate. When exchange rate speculators get more confident and more optimistic about the future value of the dollar, the value of the dollar goes up, our exports are less attractive to foreigners, and so a component of our exports go down. Um, these are the three confidence terms in autonomous baseline autonomous spending. Then there are the two foreigner terms. When foreigners become richer and more prosperous, they buy more of our exports. Uh, when foreigners raise their interest rates, um, this little star here meaning that this is a variable that applies um, to foreigners rather than a variable that applies here at home. When foreigners raise their interest rates, that means that money seeking higher rates of return on its investments flows out of this country into overseas countries. Um, that means that the demand for dollar denominated assets is less. That pushes down the value of the dollar. And as the value of the dollar falls, our products become more attractive to foreigners. They buy more of them. Our exports grow up, go up. That's the last contribution to baseline autonomous spending. Um, so to be able to use this equation um, is the last thing I'm going to want you to nail for the midterm. And we write this equation in this form um, because it then gives us the dependence of real GDP on the economic environment, on foreigners and confidence, and also on economic policy. Um, there's this first term, and then there's this second term, the multiplier times government purchases, times how much the government is actually spending to buy goods and services, 
The idea being that when the government spends more buying goods and services, that puts more people to work, and so real GDP goes up. Um, and, also, um, and also the change in foreign interest rate, or the change in domestic interest rates. When interest rates go down as well, um, the level of real GDP goes up because when interest rates go down, exports and business investment spending goes up. Add the multiplier to that, you get an extra boost um, to the level of real GDP. This equation allows you to divide changes in real GDP or deviations of real GDP from baseline into a component that's due to the economic environment, a component that's due to fiscal policy, and a component that's due to financial markets um, plus monetary policy. Um, so once again, um, to your eye clickers. Suppose nothing happens um, to the economic environment, to confidence. Um, suppose nothing happens to government purchases. But suppose that the interactions of the Federal Reserve, monetary policy, and financial markets together cut the long-term real risky interest rate R by two percentage points. Um, what's then going to happen to the level of real GDP Y? Um, now you have your multiplier terms on the bottom. Um, those are going to tell you how much a given dollar in extra baseline autonomous spending and extra autonomous spending is going to add um, to real GDP by how much a change in that flow of spending is going to be amplified because higher spending means higher GDP means higher incomes. Um, oh dear, um, we're going to have to rerun that. Uh, we are catching interference from next door, it looks like big time. All right, um, we're going to be stuck at B at 0.6. Um, well, trillion. Well, let's see. Um, R goes down by 0.02. Um, I is 20. Um, X times I is 5. So you have 25 multiplied by 0.02 will give you 0.5. And the denominator would be 1. Uh, minus 0.75 times 0.8 is 0.6. 1 minus 0.6 is 0.4. Plus 0.1 is 0.5. 1 over 0.5 is 2. Um, so they then have 2 times 0.5. Um, we then have 1, y will rise by 1 trillion a year. Um, that's going to be C. Um, that doesn't look too good. Um, you'll get better. Uh, because there are going to be a bunch of these on the midterm, and the less well people do on them in class, the more of them they're likely to be on the midterm. Um, that's got an important thing um, to try to do, to try to figure out what to do, if only because it will give you insight into current debates on economic policy going on right now. You know, right now, the Federal Reserve is undertaking a policy called quantitative easing two, um, by which the Federal Reserve is buying up a whole bunch, not of government bonds, not of short-term government bonds, but of long-term bonds of one form or another, in an attempt to push the long-term real risky interest rate R down um, relative to where it is today in the hopes that by pushing the long-term real risky interest rate down, it will get investment spending and perhaps exports at a higher pace, and that will increase GDP and reduce unemployment. Um, the argument against doing this is that the Federal Reserve is taking on a bunch of risk, of long-term risk, by holding things in its portfolio that aren't safe short-term government bonds, and we really want the Federal Reserve taking on risk. Isn't it supposed to be just a managerial agency where the idea that something might go wrong with its portfolio and the government might have to bail it out isn't something you're supposed to be worrying about? Um, on the other hand, unemployment's up at 9%, and it definitely would be nice to get it down. Figuring out whether this policy is a good thing or not, um, and I think it is a good thing, very much depends on the balance of risk and reward. Um, the risks are vague and hard to quantify, um, 
The rewards depend on this equation, on how much the policy of quantitative easing is going to succeed in reducing the, inter the interest rate on what the effects of such reduced interest rates on business investment spending and on gross exports are going to be, by how the multiplier is then going to amplify <coughs> um, those changes into changes in real GDP, and whether the Federal Reserve's actions are going to undermine any of the confidence terms that keep this variable where it, keep this flow of spending where it is and diminish it. Um, that's what the people currently arguing over quantitative easing policy in an attempt to relieve the high unemployment we currently suffer are arguing about. Um, you got to use this equation before you can even start thinking about what positions taken in this argument make a good deal of sense. Um, I'd like you to be able to use that equation um, and to get that equation right. Now, this same investment savings equation for those of you who prefer graphs. Uh, as I said last time, you can take your baseline autonomous spending measure, um, divide it by the multiplier terms, add to it government purchases. And if you're drawing a graph in which your long-term real risky interest rate is on the vertical axis, and your level of spending of demand of output production of incomes on the horizontal axis, this term will tell you where this line hits the x-axis. It will tell you what the level of real GDP in the economy would be um, if it were in fact the case that long-term real, long real risky interest rates were zero. And then the slope um, of this curve, right? the um, effect of changes in interest rates on investment and on exports divided by the multiplier, um, these slope terms tell us how much changes in the long-term real risky interest rate are going to affect aggregate demand. They tell us how this line moves up and to the left as the long-term real risky interest rate um, were to rise. Um, then if you're confronted with a situation in which you know what the long-term real risky interest rate is, if it's up here, and if you have an expansion in government's fiscal policy, if you have the government decide to spend more money to try to boost the economy, you can then calculate the effect of that um, on the economy by taking where this IS line was, moving it outward by the amount of the increase in spending times the multiplier to get from the red line to the blue line, check the blue line for where the interest rate in hits it, that tells you what the level of real GDP is. That tells you how effective fiscal policy was going to be in boosting output. Um, similarly, a decrease in government purchases. Um, a contractionary fiscal policy is going to move the IS curve in the other direction um, and move your level of real GDP back. Um, in, both, um, in both cases, you could do it you can affect the level, the government can affect the level of GDP and spending in the economy <coughs> um, by changing its own purchases, by using fiscal policy, by changing how much it's spending and also taxing in order to shift the level of real GDP. Um, but if it can also move long-term risky real interest rates, if the central bank can change the level of the interest rate, um, well, that also will move the level of real GDP. But in that case, you're not going to be shifting the IS curve left or right. Instead, you're going to be pushing the economy down the IS curve. Um, as interest rates fall, even with the IS curve in the same place, real GDP moves up because you're now on a lower position um, on the IS curve. That is, expansionary monetary policy serves as a substitute for expansionary fiscal policy. And similarly for contractionary monetary policy. That is, if the Federal Reserve either raises interest rates in such a way that they rise higher, or if things happen in financial markets to push interest rates higher, um, well, then you don't move the sh position of the IS curve. Instead, you move along the IS curve, up and back along it. And that also diminishes um, aggregate demand, output, production, spending, and income. Back in the 1930s and 1940s, 
the argument was always that, well, this IS curve doesn't have a very steep slope. It's pretty close to being a vertical line. Um, so you'd need big changes in interest rates to produce any significant change in the level of spending in an economy. And anyway, the transmission between Federal Reserve policy and market interest rates um, has a lot of slippage in it. Um, that there are lots of other things that can go on. It's not at all clear whether when the Federal Reserve changes interest rates, the markets are going to go along or not. Um, much better to use changes in government spending in order to try to get the economy to and keep it near full employment and not to worry about the, using the Federal Reserve as at its monetary policy as an economic stabilization tool. Um, then for quite a while, uh, for quite a while, there was an argument that you should not use fiscal policy but instead monetary policy. Um, an intellectual revolution led by the University of Chicago's Milton Friedman who pointed out that for a lot and large number of reasons you should expect this multiplier to be pretty small. Um, especially in a modern world where households had, lots of households had housing equity and lots of households could borrow and borrow for either from banks or on their credit cards. Um, you wouldn't expect consumption to change much if income changed, which meant the multiplier was going to be pretty small, pretty close to one which then meant that even big shifts in government purchases weren't likely to have a huge impact on real GDP. By contrast, Milton Friedman said these terms are likely to be large and important. Um, move interest rates around through monetary policy and you're going to have a big effect um, on the level of spending. Um, then comes now when our problem is even if we believe in Milton Friedman, the Federal Reserve has already done everything it can to at least push the interest rates it directly controls down to as close to zero as possible. And if you're still unhappy with the state of the economy, if you're still unhappy with 9% unemployment, kind of fiscal policy is one of the few games left um, in town. Um, once again, the review on using the IS curve, right? that is foreigners and confidence and the multiplier. Um, those are, if you're thinking in graphical terms, they're going to pick out a point on the x-axis. And fiscal policy will then shift the IS curve either left if policy is contractionary, if the government's spending less, um, or right if policy is expansionary, if the government's spending more. Will either shift, will shift the IS curve either left or right. Um, and then monetary policy plus the financial markets are then going to give you a level for the interest rate. And that interest rate is then going to pick out a point on the IS curve. It's going to tell you which of the possible points on the IS curve the economy is actually going to be at. And that will tell you what the level of income and spending um, in the economy is. Why is it called IS? Um, because as Sir John Hicks said back in 1937, it stands for when investment in the economy is in balance with savings, which turns out to be the same thing as spending in balance with production. That when the economy is on its IS curve, there's neither upward pressure on production because businesses see their inventories falling, nor downward pressure on production because businesses see um, their inventories rising. Um, so let's try this again. Um, different parameter values uh, for the multiplier, um, different interest sensitivity um, the top, um, and now we're raising um, the long-term risky real interest rate R by two percentage points. Um, what's going to happen to the level of real GDP Y um, when we do this? Um, what's going to happen when we try to shrink real GDP? Say the Federal Reserve is really worried about rising inflation. Um, says there's too much demand in the economy. There should be less. Um, okay, let's go through it. Um, our tax rate is 0.25. That means 1 minus T is 0.75. Multiply it by 0.6. Um, you get 0.45. 1 minus 0.45 is 0.55. Um, Add this 0.117 for M, and you get 0.667 on the denominator, which is the reciprocal of 1.5. So your multiplier is going to be 1.5. Um, 
to that multiplier of one and a half, we then hit that with, well, an insensitivity of investment of 10, export sensitivity plus exchange rate sensitivity, multiply those together, that's 10, that's 20. 20 times 0.02 is 0.04. There's a minus sign in front of it, so we're shrinking um, the economy. And so we have a minus 0.4 on the top um, and a 1.5 from the multiplier term. We get minus 0.6. Um, we get that Y will fall by 0.6 trillion a year. Um, that's going to be our B. Um, that's what I'm hoping to get you to be able to do. Um, if only because if you can do it, you can then say something intelligent about whether the Federal Reserve should be reined in by Congress and no longer engaging in the quantitative easing policies it's undergoing, or whether it should undertake them in the first place even if it isn't reined in by Congress, um, or whether it should be allowed to go forward um, with them. Um, that finishes our review. Um, that's what we've done in the past. Now the new stuff, right, the liquidity money stuff. Right, um, that is, we have aggregate demand in our investment savings framework. Um, this IS curve stuff, this investment savings equation. That tells us that aggregate demand depends on the long-term risky real interest rate R at which businesses can borrow and lend. When the interest rate R goes up, businesses that were thinking about borrowing in order to build new factories say, hey, wait a minute. Um, it's much more expensive to borrow. Um, we don't think our new factory will be profitable enough to pay, allow us to pay this back and still have extra money. We're going to cancel um, this new factory. Conversely, when interest rates go down, um, the businesses say, hey, look how cheap money is. Um, we should take this money and we should, you, we should borrow money because we can so cheaply and use it to do something productive. We don't care what. Um, we should do something. Similarly, on the other side, um, companies like Apple or Microsoft that have large cash hoards right now are always wondering what should we do with our large cash hoard. One thing to do is to lend it out. Another thing is to use it in their own operations to expand them. When interest rates are high, lending out your cash looks more attractive relative to using them to expand your scale of operations. Um, when interest rates are low, the benefits to lending out your money are very slim and so you're more inclined to use them to increase of the scale of operations. Um, and it's not just business investment spending. All right, when interest rates are low, house prices tend to be high and stock market values tend to be high and so consumers feel rich. Um, and so there are things not in our little income expenditure model which tend to say that consumers have more confidence when interest rates are low than when they're high and so consumers tend to spend more. And the final channel, something that is in our income expenditure model, is the exports one. Um, when interest rates fall, the dollar is likely to fall too, which makes US goods look like a bargain to foreigners, and hence their exports um, are likely to rise. So there are a bunch of channels um, of varying strength and power and of uncertain strength of power by which aggregate demand um, depends on the long-term risky real interest rate R. When the interest rate is lower, the economy is going to be at a point on the IS curve um, that tends down and to the right that has a high level of real GDP. When interest rates are higher, the economy is going to be on a point up and to the left um, on the IS curve at a lower level of real GDP. Now, where does this risky, real, long-term interest rate come from? Um, what determines it? It's set in financial markets, right? that that's what financial markets are. A bunch of people buying and selling bonds and other securities for a price, and associated with each price for a bond is an interest rate. Um, and the Federal Reserve is in there intervening in financial markets every single day. The Federal Reserve buys and sells short-term government bonds for cash, and sometimes, as now, it does other things. Um, and by buying and selling short-term government bonds for cash, experience has taught us that the Federal Reserve can set the interest rate for short-term, safe, nominal government bonds. 
call that I, um, whatever, wherever it wants. You know, the Federal Reserve can control this sucker, and it does. But this I um, isn't this R. Um, sh the interest rate on short-term nominal safe U.S. Treasury bonds, um, Treasury bills that are due three months from now, is different from the interest rate on long-term risky real bonds of one sort or another, the interest rate that a company would have to pay if it went out into the markets right now and said we want to borrow a whole bunch of money in order to build a new factory. There's a lot of slippage um, between I and R. <coughs> and that slippage is financial economics. You take a financial economics course here and you'll do nothing else but study the slippage between I and R. But let's start with I. Uh, let's start with the Federal Reserve, um, the money stock, and interest rates. Um, and the way to think about it um, is that you want to have, everyone wants to have some liquid cash money um, in their pockets. Um, or not just liquid cash money. Um, money in your pockets, money in your checking account, um, unused balances on your credit card that you could actually use to boost, you know, um, that you could actually use to spend if you wanted to spend more. Um, desired money holdings um, are, and your desired money holdings, um, they're given by what economists call the quantity theory of money. Um, that given your spending level, the price level times the level of real GDP, um, you're going to want to hold enough money in your pockets and in your bank accounts so that when money moves at the velocity appropriate to current interest rates, you're happy. If you have more M than you want to have, if the right side of this equation is bigger than the left side, well, you'll then have too much cash in your pockets and you're going to want to try to dump some of it, to use it to buy something else. Um, if you have too little money in your pockets, well, once again, you're going to try to build up your money balances. You're going to take one of your other assets and you're going to try to sell it in order to build up your money balances. Um, and there's a, um, a feedback effect, that when interest rates are higher, you want to spend your money faster. You don't want to have excess money when you could be making a bundle by holding your wealth in bonds. So whenever the Federal Reserve or the banking system expands M, um, does something to expand the money stock, people are then going to turn around and try to take some of their excess money and buy bonds with it instead. Um, when the Federal, Reserve, the Federal Reserve expands M, demand for bonds goes up. An increased demand for bonds is going to push up the price of bonds. You know, simple supply and demand. A lot more people say we have extra cash, we'd rather have this cash in 10-year treasury bonds or three-month treasury bills. Um, let's go out and buy some. And here things get complex because the prices and the interest rates on bonds move in opposite directions. When the price goes up, the interest rate goes down. Um, when the price goes down, the interest rate goes up. The best way to, th to see this is to think about two different kinds of bonds. Um, on the one hand, a pure discount bond. Um, like a treasury bill. Um, a treasury bill doesn't say on its front what its interest rate is. Um, a treasury bill is just a promise by the U.S. government to pay the owner of it $1,000 three months from now. And whenever the treasury borrows money through treasury bills, what it does is it auctions off these treasury bills. Here, they say, is a promise from the U.S. Treasury to pay you $1,000 in cash three months from now. How much will you bid for this bond um, in cash right now? Um, and indeed, the Treasury bond has a price when issued. Currently, the price is something like $999 for each $1,000 Treasury bond, but it does have a price. Um, and then you can think, if I invest in Treasury bonds, what's the interest rate um, I'm going to earn on my money. Well, and the answer is, well, you can calculate the interest rate off of the price um, of the treasury bond. Um, suppose you can buy a treasury bond right now for $999. Uh, 
Well, that means that you're going to get um, $1,000 for it in three months. 1,000 minus 999 is $1. Um, that means you get one over $999 um, in three months. That's your interest payment on your treasury bill. But that's for three months. We report interest rates in, in terms of percent per year. Um, so you get one 999th times four, because if you did this four times in a row, you'd get four times as much. So we have four over 0.999, um, which is about 0.4 over 100, um, which would mean that a treasury bond that's selling at 999 would be paying you an interest rate of four-tenths of 1% per year. Um, Actually, today, I think it's more like four hundredths of 1% per year. They're not selling for $999. They're selling for $999.90. That's how you calculate the interest rate on a pure discount bond. Um, that is one that gives you principal back, but that doesn't pay you any interest. In the meantime, um, you perform this calculation. You calculate the interest rate. As you can see, when P goes up, I goes down. Or take the opposite. Um, at the moment, the United States government doesn't issue any consolidated security loans, consuls, is what they're called, one of the first acronyms. The US government doesn't issue any consolidated security loans. Um, Britain used to. Britain doesn't. Um, a, con a consul is a perpetual bond. Um, that is, it never expires. When the British government used to issue consuls, it would say, here is a promise from the King of England. Um, the King of England will pay you, say, 40 pounds a year forever, right? until the sun falls and beyond that. You know, as long as there's an England, as long as there's a King of England, um, he's going to pay you 40 pounds a year forever. How much will you bid for a, for a promise from the King of England to pay you 40 pounds forever? Um, when people would bid in the auction and it would have a price. Um, and what would the annual rate of return on, say, a 4% console with a face value of a 1,000 pounds sterling be? Um, well, a 4% console with a face value of 1,000 pounds would carry an annual interest payment of 40 pounds with it. You'd simply take the 40 pounds, you'd divide it by the price. That would give you the long-term nominal interest rate on the console. And once again, when P goes up, um, because demand for bonds is higher, the interest rate on the bond, in this case IL, the long-term safe nominal interest rate, goes down. In the real world, we don't have consoles, and we only have a few discount bonds, the treasury bills. Um, almost all the bonds out there that are sold are bonds that have a maturity, a date at which the government or whoever you loan the money to pays you back your principal. And in the meantime, in the meantime carries periodic interest rates, usually every six months or so. Um, used to be that we actually had bearer bonds, um, things where you carried the bond around with you. And the bond would have a large 8.5 by 11 thing with fancy engraving to prevent counterfeiting, saying it was a bond. And at the bottom of it, there would be little coupons, you know, the kind of tear-off coupons that you see on the signs where, you know, dog walking or homework help call, you know, 643-2152 or whatever with little tear-off things at the bottom so you can tear one off and take with you. Um, except these bonds... Um, the numbers were rather larger. Um, outside the Secretary of the Treasury's dining room, they used to have framed some copies of, I think, a $50 million bond from 1971, which still had some of its coupons attached. For some reason, I don't understand. Um, there'd be this thing that said face value of $50 million. Um, and then because it was a 6% bond, um, its annual, coupon, its annual coupon payments were $3 million, um, which meant every six months payment was $1.5 million. And so there'd be this little thing at the bottom, you know, about two inches by one inch, which would say pay to the bearer upon receipt $1.5 million. Um, and when people walked up to this and took a look at it, you could sometimes see them thinking, um, if I broke the glass and grabbed one of these things, 
Could I then get one and a half million dollars? I'm down at the treasury cash room. Um, the answer, no, you couldn't. Um, the bonds now have to be registered to their registered owners. The treasury won't pay you unless you're the properly registered owner. And anyway, the cash room is now closed. Um, but in the old days, um, you used to show up and tear off your coupon and hand it over, and they'd hand back the money. Which is why that if you hear people talk about bonds, you'll find that the every six month interest payment that you get on one is still often called the coupon payment. <coughs> As if it's a $5 off coupon from CVS. Uh, in this case, a 1.5 million um, coupon for the US Treasury from the early 1970s. Um, though nowadays, everything is done by electronic funds transfer, if only because that creates an electronic trail and it's easy to unwind if something goes wrong. Um, so that's the brief excursion into financial um, economics, um, what a bond is. Um, and now we can see how the Federal Reserve controls interest rates. Um, you know, suppose it buys bonds for cash. All of a sudden, people out there have more cash and they probably have more cash than they want. So they're going to want to dump some of their cash and buy bonds with it. On the other hand, the Federal Reserve has just bought up a bunch of bonds. So the Federal Reserve has decreased the supply of bonds as well. Um, decreased supply of bonds and increased demand for bonds means the prices of bonds rise. Um, and rising bond prices mean falling interest rates. And interest rates keep on falling until people are happy holding the newly enlarged quantity of money in the system. Um, interest rates keep falling until interest rates have fallen sufficiently low that people's desire to spend the money in their pockets quickly has fallen off. People are no longer saying, gee, this money in my pocket, I should spend it quickly or else invest it, I'm losing interest. People say instead, meh. Um, the interest rate's so low that I really don't care that I have extra cash in my pockets. I'm happy. I'm holding it there. When that happens, the interest rate settles at its new level appropriate to the newly enlarged quantity of money in the system. Um, OK, so how much of that has sunk in? Um, when the supply of money goes up and the supply of bonds go down as a result of expansionary open market operations, of purchases of bonds for cash from the Federal Reserve, what's going to happen um, to the price of bonds when the supply of money goes up and the supply of bonds goes down? OK, you're right. Yep, the supply of price of bonds goes up. Um, a higher supply of money means a greater demand for bonds. A lower supply of bonds means less supply of bonds. More demand, less supply means the price goes up. Um, the price of bonds um, goes up. Um, and then when the price of bonds goes up, um, what's going to happen to the interest rate out there? Uh, what happens to the interest rate on bonds when the prices of bonds goes up? Yep, um, when the price of bonds goes up, right, the interest rate goes down. Um, they move inversely to each other. And the interest rate goes down, what happens to exports um, and to investment spending when the interest rate falls? Okay. Say, so let's give you five more seconds. Uh, this is getting boring. Um, yep, and when the interest rate goes down, exports and investment spending both go up. Um, right. And when in exports and investment spending goes up, what happens to real GDP? 
And yep, real GDP goes up. That's the monetary transmission mechanism. The Federal Reserve does something to the demand and to the amount of money and the amount of bonds in the system that shakes the prices of bonds and the interest rates on them, which in turn shakes the level of investment spending and exports, and which in turn changes the level of real GDP. Um, here's how the Federal Reserve does it. Um, Here's the interest rate on three-month treasury bills in the secondary market. Um, that is, these aren't people buying and selling to the treasury. These are people buying and selling um, to each other. Um, the treasury only buys and sells treasury bond bills about once a month. Um, so if you want to figure out what the interest rate on treasury bills is for the other 29 days of the month, you have to look at, um, you have to look at the prices at which dealers and investment banks and commercial banks are selling treasury bills to each other. Um, these, and that gives you a daily series rather than just an every month auction series. Here's what's happened um, to the real interest rate on US treasury bills. Um, oh god, since, well, since um, my third year as an assistant professor, since 1990 or so. Um, in 1990, um, Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Federal Reserve, and Alan Greenspan and his Federal Reserve Open Market Committee had raised the interest rate on Treasury bills up to 8%. Um, they had done so because one October Monday in 1997, um, the stock market had crashed. Uh, the stock market had crashed by 25% um, on that one particular Monday for no good fundamental reason that anyone could explain. <coughs> Economists like Myron Scholes and Robert Merton and Eugene Fama tried to claim it was because a US congressional committee had taken a particular vote indicating that they were going to be less likely to be approving of future corporate takeovers. Um, but you know, the Congress does such things once a week in terms of taking a committee vote that changes the odds of what the financial regulatory framework would be. And this was the only such thing in history that is associated with a 25% fall in the level of the stock market. Um, we, think, uh, we think that this crisis, that this particular stock market crash was actually made up at the Haas School of Business uh, by Professor Emeritus Hain Leland. Um, together with his partners O'Brien and Rubenstein, because he had been evolving the first computer-driven trading systems, and he had offered to um, help money managers use computers to rapidly and quickly trade stocks in order to hedge risks and quickly get out of positions in whenever they thought that it might be very good to get out of a position because prices were going to move in some direction or other. And so what happened was that um, early on this Monday, Hain Leland's computers got a bunch of orders from financial managers saying they wanted to sell stocks. And so the computers dumped all their stocks onto the market. Um, and as those stocks dumped, were dumped onto the market, prices began to go down, which led other people to say, well, gee, we should sell as well, which then meant that all the people who'd we're following computerized strategies through Leland, O'Brien, and Rubenstein, by which when prices went down, they would sell, started to sell as well, which meant that all the people who were following Leland O'Brien's competitors started to sell too, and then a whole bunch of people who simply saw stocks were going down for no reason they could think of said something bad is happening to the market and we need to sell as well. And by the end of the day, prices were down by 25%. Um, that night, uh, my grandfather and grandmother Lord came to dinner at our house, at my wife's and my house, and um, <coughs> saw you know, the two of us in our kind of brand new little suburban house. Um, and he was rich then, and I think he had lost about a million and a half dollars that day. Uh, and he was also 73. Um, and his reaction was, well, it was an interesting day, um, but nothing to worry about. I'm in the stock market for the long term. Values fluctuate. Um, I like these stocks on Friday, and I like the companies these stocks are in today. 
um, just as much. Um, think of it this way, I now have an opportunity to buy more of stocks I like at 25% off. I'm going to be in there the following morning buying stocks. Uh, and he was. Um, and there's a lot to admire for that, um, especially since he was at 73 or so planning, thinking he's still at a long-term time horizon. <laughs> in fact, he did live until 95 and actually could use practically every cent uh, that he made then because old age is expensive. Um, so Alan Greenspan had responded to this crash of the stock market by saying, oh my God, maybe a depression's coming. We need to cut interest rates to encourage investment spending and exports. And he had cut interest rates substantially in late 1997 and kept them low in 1998, or 1987 and 88. And then come the end of 1988, the Federal Reserve was saying we overdid it. We cut interest rates and so we boosted investment spending and exports, but there's no depression coming. We shouldn't have done that. In fact, right now there's too much spending in the economy and so as a result there's a lot of spending chasing less production and inflation's on the rise. And we really don't want people to get back into the frame of mind they got back in the 1970s when they expect that every year inflation will be a little bit higher than it was the year before, we need to cool off the economy. We need to create a situation in which there actually is a little rise in unemployment, in which there's a little recession, in order to underscore to people that um, we won't, the Federal Reserve will not let inflation take hold in the American economy again. And so gradually in 1988 and 99, they pushed the unemployment rate or the inflation rate up to 8% where they were holding it in early 1990 and scratching their heads and saying, why are all these businesses still borrowing to build factories when the short term nominal interest rate is 8%? This doesn't make much sense to us. And they were thinking about raising it higher. And then lo and behold, in late 1990, the recession that they were predicting and that they, in fact they had wanted came on. Um, a small recession um, and they said, oh, that's good. Now at least the market knows that we aren't in the business of permanently accommodating inflation. Now we can return interest rates to normal. Um, and so then they returned interest rates to normal gradually over the next two or three years and then pushed them down from the then normal of 5% down to 3%. Um, saying that, well, there are these various long-term deficit reduction bills moving through the Congress, cutting back on federal spending. If you cut back on government purchases, that's going to put downward pressure on aggregate demand. Um, we don't want a good fiscal policy over the long term that gets America's government finances back into order. We don't want such a good fiscal policy to be accompanied by a further rise in unemployment. So we're going to cut the government a break. We're going to cut President Clinton and his congressional coalition a break by pushing interest rates down below their normal level for then of 5% to 3%. In that way, we're going to get some more export spending. We're going to get some more business investment spending. It's a good way of rewarding <coughs> politicians who are behaving uh, more or less, who are behaving more or less normally and righteously. And we're going to keep interest rates down at 3% as long as we can which Greenspan did throughout 1993 and most of 1994 as the Clinton administration tried to move its deficit reduction packages through Congress. And we succeeded and we are all still very grateful to Alan Greenspan for doing this because we think it was a wonderful thing for the country. And then come the end of 1994, Greenspan says, okay, the economy is now well established. It's time to raise interest rates back to their normal levels. And they did. And they then kept them there between 1995 and 1998 or so as the dot-com boom got established. Um, and all the while there were a bunch of people saying, wait a minute, the economy is overheating. Wait a minute, inflation's around the corner. Wait a minute, interest rates should be rising, raising interest rates some more. Um, Greenspan didn't. In fact, the next move of interest rates was down again during the Russian financial crisis of 1998. Um, which led Alan Greenspan to interrupt a tennis vacation he was having in August to actually come to UC Berkeley and up at the Haas School announce this change in monetary policy, uh, which we all went to and we clapped. 
Um, the, the Russian financial crisis of 1998 quickly passed. Um, and then throughout 99, 2000, and into early 2001, the Federal Reserve gradually raised interest rates, thinking that the unemployment rate was now well below 4%, um, and that couldn't be sustainable forever, um, that the dot-com boom was turning into a bubble, which then collapsed at the end of 2001. Uh, and the Federal Reserve lowered short-term interest rates rapidly in an attempt to keep this little recession here from becoming a big recession, saying, wait a minute, businesses are no longer investing like mad because they're over-optimistic <laughs> because of the dot-com business. Um, we need to lower interest rates to give businesses more of an incentive to invest as it is. Um, then comes September 11, 2001, um, this blank here when no treasury bills are traded. Uh, then they resume um, cutting interest rates and cutting interest rates further, worrying about the fact that economic growth in the early 2000s seemed to be anemic and thinking perhaps we should lower interest rates a little bit more in order to give businesses even more of an incentive to invest before in late 2004 starting on the process of raising interest rates back to normal levels again. And then they kept them at normal levels in 2007 until our current financial crisis started. During our current financial crisis, uh, well, there's been somewhat confused. There have been episodes in which there's a big gap uh, between when no one's trading. But since the start of the current crisis, the Federal Reserve has, with one short interruption, dropped the short-term nominal interest rates it controls to within hailing distance of zero and kept them there. And right now, the betting is that the Federal Reserve is going to keep its short-term nominal interest rates near zero, at least through the end of 2011 and into 2012, and possibly further. Um, so the Federal Reserve can peg the short-term safe nominal interest rate I in the economy, but there's one thing it cannot do. It cannot drive an interest rate below zero. Um, there's nothing it can do to make someone willing to pay more than $1,000 today for a treasury bill which prom the government promised to pay you $1,000 in three months. Um, if it tries, people will say, huh, well, I have my $1,000 now. I'd just rather stick it in my safety deposit box for three months rather than pay $1,001 uh, now to get a treasury bill worth 1000 and that's not quite true. Uh, we do actually see some transactions at which people pay more than a thousand bucks for a treasury bill. Um, either they desperately want to have it as collateral for some particular transaction that requires a treasury bill rather than cash, um, or because they want to save on transactions costs by getting into the electronic system. Um, but Interest rates generally don't go, nominal interest rates generally don't go below zero, and that's where they are right now. The Federal Reserve can peg the short-term safe nominal interest rate I, um, but we're not terribly, businesses aren't terribly interested in what the short-term interest rate is, because a business building a factory um, has to think that it's going to be borrowing its money not just overnight, not just for the next three months, but for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so businesses are much more interested in what are the interest rates that are currently being charged for 10 or 20 year loans. Um, and the long-term safe nominal interest rate, IL, um, what the US Treasury has to pay to borrow, what government bonds are currently sell for, depends not just on what um, I today is, but on what bond speculators expect the Federal Reserve to make the short-term interest rate in the future. Hence, there's this term premium that we're going to write rho to the superscript T, T for term premium. And the long-term interest rate on treasury bonds is going to be equal to the short-term interest rate on treasury bills um, plus this term premium. Um, what is this term premium? Um, well, here we plot both the three-month treasury bill interest rate um, against the 10-year um, treasury bond interest rate. And the term premium is best thought of 
as what people expect the Federal Reserve to do over the next 10 years, plus some other terms, plus some extra allowance for the fact that if you're investing in a long-term bond, it's a risky thing to do. Uh, maybe the bond price will go down over the next three months, and maybe you'll want to sell it over the next three months. Uh, with a treasury bill, you know you have only have to wait three months to get your money back in full. With a treasury bond, you have to wait fully 10 years to be sure certain of getting your money back in full. Um, there's risk involved in holding such a security. Um, generally, um, so generally what you can say is that whenever it's the case that the long-term treasury interest rate is less than the short-term interest rate, people are expecting the Federal Reserve to quickly cut short-term interest rates, as people were expecting them in 2001. Uh, people were saying the next move in short-term interest rates is likely to be down, um, so we're not going to hold um, you know, we're not going to be willing to hold a treasury bond um, unless its interest rate um, is kind of, unless the interest interest, but given, no, that, but given that we expect um, the next move in short-term interest rates to be down, um, we're going to sell off some of our treasury, long-term treasury bonds now um, to make, no, that's just too confusing. Um, let me start over again. That we have a choice between holding our money in a long-term treasury bond and selling our long-term treasury bond and then investing a whole bunch of money in our treasury bills. But we invest in a treasury bill now. In four years, we expect interest rates to be a lot lower than they are now. So as a result, we expect the interest rate on treasury bills over the future to be relatively low. Because we expect the interest rate in the future on treasury bills to be relatively low, we're willing to pay a relatively high price for treasury bonds, which means we're actually willing to own treasury bonds now, even though the interest rate we get on them is less than the interest rate we'd get right now on a treasury bill, because we don't think this interest rate would stick. Um, we see this three times over the past generation. First, just before the start of this graph in 1989, um, a so-called inversion, or four times, inversion of the yield curve. Um, second, during the 1998 Russian crisis, when for a while they thought it was going to be really bad and the Federal Reserve would cut short-term interest rates by a lot, which it did not do, at the peak of the dot-com bubble, and then at the peak of the housing bubble. There's this general expectation that the Federal Reserve is about to cut back um, on its short-term in, on its short-term interest rates. Um, and you also see that um, short-term and long-term interest rates move together whenever the Treasury does, or whenever the Federal Reserve does something relatively surprising. Nobody was expecting Alan Greenspan to raise interest rates in 1994 and 95 by as much as he did. Uh, people thought that he was going to mosey along keeping interest rates at their low level of 3% for an extra year or two. Um, at least that's what I thought at the Treasury. One of my analytical naders when I worked at the Treasury was writing various memos for Secretary of the Treasury Lloyd Benson saying it looks like this low interest rate policy is going to continue for another year or two. Um, big mistake when he started raising interest rates rapidly. Um, not my mistake alone because as the Treasury raised its short-term, or as the Federal Reserve raised its short-term interest rates, people holding long-term bonds said, wait a minute, um, we, these long-term bonds aren't worth holding at these prices, we've got to mark up the interest rates on long-term bonds as well. Um, similarly, when no one had thought that the financial crisis would get as bad as it actually got, um, you have this little recovery in the summer of 2008, and then when the federal the crisis really hits and the Federal Reserve cuts short-term interest rates to zero, long-term interest rates fall too, responding to the Federal Reserve's cut of short-term interest rates um, and only then um, bouncing back up. The lesson you should get from this graph is that the Federal Reserve can move long-term interest rates as well as short-term interest rates. Whenever the Federal Reserve does something big um, to short-term interest rates, the market will follow and long-term interest rates will move too, 
Long-term interest rates won't move as much, and they won't necessarily move as in sync. There's a lot of slippage between the short-term and the long-term interest rate. Um, and there's also risk and default premia in there. Um, that is, even if you know what the long-term treasury bond rate is, that doesn't help you very much as a business because companies cannot borrow at the treasury rate. Um, they might default, and when they do default, it's when their creditors would most want to have their money back. Um, so companies have to pay an interest rate premium that is greater than the expected default times the probability times the losses in default. If you take a look at um, you know, the treasury interest rate, um, this red line here, and then the interest rate that junk bonds um, are issued at. Um, say this is a junk bond issued interest rate. It's actually the treasury rate plus twice the spread between the BAA bond rate um, and the treasury rate. Um, this is a much better guide to the interest rates that risky companies would actually have to pay if they wanted to borrow money by issuing a bond at any point since 1990. Um, and you see that generally there is this three percentage point gap uh, between the treasury rate and this junk bond sub BAA rate. Um, sometimes it gets bigger, um, like just after 9-11, um, during the couple years afterwards, it got up to 8%. Um, that's a big gap when the normal gap is 3%. If you think of a 3% gap being that your average risky company, you'll lose 3% of your money each year if you invest in a bond there rather than a treasury, that you kind of kind of invert that and say, well, that says that there is a probability of about 1 30th um, that a company will go bankrupt, um, that an average company lives for maybe 30 years before something bad happens, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in bankruptcy court. Um, that's about right. Um, an 8% spread. Um, as you had in 2002 and 2003, is rather large. Seems to be indicative of a certain amount of panic on the part of financial markets. Um, a panic that was then relatively quickly eased between 2002 and 2005 as spreads returned to more or less normal levels. And then starting in 2007, they started to diverge. And then starting in September 2008, all hell broke loose. And at the peak, if you were a risky company wanting to borrow, you had to pay 12.5% more in interest rates on this measure than if you were the U.S. Treasury um, wanting to borrow, which means that people were kind of expecting one chance in eight that you would go bankrupt over the course of the next year, um, which is A, high, um, and B, large, um, and C, um, if you're a company thinking about building up your capacity and buying a new fact, buying a new factory, and you're quoted an interest rate of 15%, um, you're going to think twice about whether you want to invest in expanding your capacity at all. So that even though here during this period, this is exactly the period when the Treasury is dropping the interest rates, it controls the short-term safe nominal interest rate to zero. Um, and long-term treasury interest rates are falling along, but the financial markets aren't. Uh, this is the time when the financial market is bidding the interest rate that risky companies actually have to pay to borrow, up to 15% or so. There is that much slippage between the interest rates the Federal Reserve's control and the interest rates that companies have to pay. Um, but there's also the inflation discount. Uh, that is, companies really don't care about the nominal interest rate. They care about the real interest rate instead. Um, if you tell them that they have to pay an interest rate of 10% per year so that the amount of money they'll have to be paid back is quadrupled in 14 years, um, oh, but, I, the will, but by the way, there's going to be inflation over the next 14 years, so the price, so that the price level in 14 years is going to be four times what it is today. The companies will say, big whoop, we have to pay back four times as many dollars in 14 years, but the products we make will be selling for four times as much in 14 years. That's a zero as far as we're concerned. And so in order to figure out what the long-term risky real interest rate is, we not only take the short-term nominal safe treasury rate, we add onto it the term premium to get the long-term safe nominal treasury rate, 
we add on the risk term to get the risky long-term nominal interest rate. We then subtract off the expected inflation rate to get the long-term risky real interest rate. Um, how do we calculate what the expected inflation rate is? Well, since 2003, the US Treasury does it for us. Um, the US Treasury now issues two bonds, one of which just pays you a fixed interest rate every year. Um, that's this sucker up here. The other of which pays you an interest rate each year, which is equal to the interest rate on the bond plus the rate of inflation. That's this blue line down here. Um, the gap between these two lines is what people expect the average rate of inflation to be over the next 10 years, or at least what the people trading in this particular market um, think the average rate of inflation is going to be over the next 10 years. Um, and since they started up this market in 2003, yeah, well, the inflation rate that people expected was bouncing around between 2 and 2.8 percent, then bouncing around between 2.2 and 2.8 percent through the early 2000s until we get into mid-2008. Uh, and then all of a sudden expected inflation falls to zero um, as the financial crisis really hits. And then starting early in 2009, it recovers to more or less normal. It's still showing signs of uncertainty. Right? The inflation rate, expected inflation rate in early 2010 over the next 10 years got down to 1.5%. Um, since then, it's gone back up to 2.4%. Um, people now expect inflation over the next 10 years to be more or less its normal 2% plus um, for the next decade. Which is why conservatives on the Federal Reserve right now tend to say the Federal Reserve must be doing something right. Uh, because if the Federal Reserve were doing something wrong, um, well, then either people would be expecting some chance of deflation, and this expectation would be way down here, or people would be expecting some chance of accelerating inflation, and it would be up here. The fact that the inflation discount is now trading in its normal range tells us that Fed policy is about right or so the inflation hawks tend to say. Um, you can then subtract this off, and you get our estimate of junk bond long-term risky real interest rates. Um, this is probably the best series to look at for figuring out what the R that goes into the investment savings equation is. Um, no, what is it? Um, no, what is it that businesses have to pay? in terms of real claims over goods and services in the future, if they want to borrow money and use it to buy factories and expand their occupations, um, or expand their operations. And in this graph, you can indeed genuinely see the salience of the recession and the financial crisis, um, what it did to businesses' cost of borrowing. And you can also see that things have gotten well, you know, now not down to mid-2000s normal yet. Um, <clears throat> but that right now things aren't that depressed. The cost of capital, even to risky businesses, is not that high. Um, that most of business reluctance to invest is right now a product of low confidence and also an observation of the fact that there's little demand um, out there. Um, here's adding, putting everything up, um, the wedges the gap between the short-term safe interest rate that the Federal Reserve actually controls since 2003, um, this little red thing here, showing low interest rates after 9-11 and during the first stages of the recovery, followed by raising interest rates back to normal levels in the mid-2000s, uh, and then the, starting with the coming of the financial crisis, bunches of cuts in interest rates until they hit and stay at zero. Um, the difference between the safe nominal in short-term interest rate the Federal Reserve controls and the long-term real interest rate that matters for demand and spending. Um, and I think that shows you both the power and the limits um, of monetary policy. That is, as the Federal Reserve held interest rates very low in the early 2000s, it eventually persuaded financial markets that they were going to stay down. And so they did get a significant decline in real interest rates, um, which they wanted in order to make it easier for firms to borrow and invest. 
but then starting here, well, all I can say about this is that interest rates have probably been somewhat lower than if the Federal Reserve had just kept them at 5% um, since the start of 2007. Um, that the Federal Reserve influences, it does not control these interest rates. And let me stop there and continue on Thursday.